preparing to live stream the meeting. We are going live on YouTube. Whoa, so yay! Are you recording as well or just live stream? Uh, both. <clears throat> All right, we are live. To live stream the meeting. We are going live on YouTube. Whoa, so yay! Are you recording as well or just live stream? Uh, we uh, are doing both. both. Okay, we are doing both, and we are live. We are live on YouTube, and welcome, Chief Philip Scott. My name is, um, hello everyone, my name is Bailon Mejino, the uh, founder of Global Dream Makers and the creator of the Dream Maker Matrix, and welcome to the Leader's Edge. We are resuming our sessions. We will be meeting weekly on Wednesdays, and I hope you will continue to follow us. Um, go ahead and Hit the like, hit the follow, whatever it is on your screen, and, and you'll get more notifications of when we're happening again. So, I am welcoming today Chief Philip Scott of Ancestral Voice. Hello, Chief Philip. Hello, my man. Good to be with you again, and uh, <clears throat> blessed winter solstice for the people that reside in the Northern Hemisphere. Ah, oh, you know, I, I always forget about that. What is it in the Southern Hemisphere? Currently, it's the summertime. <laughs> the summer solstice yes okay oh boy <laughs> um let me tell them all about you as soon as my screen comes up there we go okay <sighs> it's our first time in a little while everyone your patience is greatly appreciated so philip scott of ancestral voice of mixed ancestry and thrice struck by lightning, Philip Scott has faithfully walked the native path for 40 years, learning from and sanctioned by traditional medicine holy people, tribal spiritual leaders, wisdom keepers, and elders from several indigenous cultures. Annually sun dancing in the Lakota tradition for over three decades, he is a ceremonial leader and traditional healer entrusted to share indigenous wisdom and medicine practices with the contemporary world. Interviewed both nationally and internationally, his life experience and writings have been featured in journals and books, in addition to directing and teaching the programs at Ancestral Voice Institute for Indigenous Lifeways in Northern California, which he founded in 1994. He maintains a private healing practice, performs ceremonies, conducts intensives, gives lectures, and leads pilgrimages worldwide. He is skilled in survival and primitive technologies and has received a master's degree from Naropa University and is also a licensed EMT. So welcome, Chief Philip. Thank you, Bella. It's, it's wonderful to have you. I know we've had you on our, our summits. We, you've been there at um, our Global Dream Makers summits, and that was really beautiful the sharings that you did and i wanted to make sure that you came here what ends up being our our first one as we're resuming but especially for here for winter solstice winter solstice uh, which is for me and my community really is a time of let's close the chapter that we have just been through especially since it's the end of the year and let's now turn our vision toward the future can you explain to us in the the indigenous ways, what is the winter solstice? Well, it's an auspicious beginning for you to start your new journey with uh, your interviews on YouTube, and uh, very honored to initiate this next cycle of your own service in the world. So, currently in the northern hemisphere, we are commencing a new a new cycle. Right? So this is an auspicious threshold with which we pass, uh, known as the winter solstice. And it's regarded as the season of dreaming. So generally in the Northern hemisphere, the temperatures are cooler. There may be blankets of snow on the ground. So it's a movement to go within. It's a time of deep reflection and introspection. Oftentimes we are gathered uh, you know, in various dwellings to share the stories of creation. Uh, many ceremonies are conducted in this time uh, to reinforce, say, the origin stories of creation within whatever nation they're a part of. 
And so um, we notice that there's a, an, an inward glance and reflection. And so um, it's really the time for us to receive instructions and directions from the ancestors in our dream time. Um, oftentimes, you know, physiologically speaking, the body uh, shifts and changes in this time. So the metabolism slows, people enjoy greater sleep often in terms of slumber at night. Um, there's also a, um, an opportunity for us to, to look at our lives, not only uh, from the last season, but basically a recapitulation, if you will, of the entire year that we've had. So I really encourage your viewers and our listeners to take this time of the winter season to reflect and recapitulate about what transpired in your entire calendar year, right? From the beginning of, of, this, of this year until now, what were some of the challenges or adversities that you encountered? What were some of the blessings and the gifts that you received as well? So it's a time of a deep reflection, uh, maybe perhaps examining the, the patterns or the addictions that arose or the fractures that occurred in terms of your relationships and to, to take a moment to receive and glean the medicine from these opportunities that we have, as well as therefore to take it to the spirit world, to ask the ancestors in our dream time to provide guidance and counsel on how best to heal and how best to move forward in our life in this next new calendar year. And certainly within this winter season, so that when we emerge in the spring, that we are utilizing these dreams and therefore acting upon them. Yes, and, and as we're, I, I, the thing that's coming up for me is that as we are going through all of this, you know, all of this shedding and honoring of what has been and bringing forth what we want to bring forward, that the overall understanding of, of why we're here, the overall understanding of, of how are we to be in our leadership in our lives and in our communities, um, that understanding has to be the, the bedrock that everything stands upon. And you said, um, receive the instructions. And I remember before you had said that many have forgotten our original instructions. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? So <clears throat> each and every one of us comes to this earth, which is our classroom here, with a mission and a purpose regarded as original instructions. And it is incumbent and essential that all of us remember these instructions and act upon them for the benefit of the collective. Now, in addition to the individual original instructions, there's also a collective species instructions that we also have. And frankly, I believe that as a species, we are forgetting our collective original instructions which are namely to be protectors of this earth and providers, you know, meaning that we are responsible stewards of ensuring that our mother earth survives for future generations and that all of our relations who dwell upon this earth with us <clears throat> are also safeguarded. Mm. Yes, yes. So, when it when you're when you're looking at you know I I've been around a lot of people who are watching a lot of the news and yes we do need to be informed about what's happening in the world yet there's so much of the the violence and the war the lack of harmony the the difficulty that people are, are going through it's not saying that they're not going through difficulty but I think the difficulties can be exacerbated by all the negative um, exposure that we are getting. And it's, you know, it, 
it's almost addicting to have to start to watch it and then not be able to pull your eyes away, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you, when people are in that place of, of almost being mesmerized, uh, it's almost like an addiction. How do you um, uh, guide people or advise people to flip the switch or to just go to something more positive? You are absolutely correct. Media is definitely one of the addictions that we have in this world. And there is such a preponderance of us to focus on the negative and the toxic in our world. And certainly there is an escalation of violence and aggression that we have in this world. And, you know, my, you know, oftentimes people will will participate in ceremony with me, just as, for example, tonight, we will have a ceremony and observance of the winter solstice here within my community, as well as uh, virtually uh, via Zoom as well. Um, and so, you know, there is a favorable aspect to technology as well, just as we are engaging in a, you know, constructive um, conversation, right? So, Oftentimes, however, it's challenging for people to turn off their phones, right? There's a, a withdrawal, if you will, this addictive uh, quality and pattern that people have with, with their phones. Oftentimes, it's even exacerbated when we are off in, say, uh, the wilderness for a week, and people have to go through almost a kind of uh, withdrawal and um, as they are weaning themselves from technology. So, you know, my encouragement is for people not to be a slave to technology, but its master. And what that means is being able to turn off your phone, right? Being able to, to actually sit in one spiritual practice, right? Um, now, I firmly encourage people to educate themselves about what's transpiring in the world. Because that's important, because that's also the ground of our spiritual practice so that we can pray for what is occurring in this world, for the misfortunes that people are experiencing and the hardships that we are individually and collectively enduring. And so it's important for us to be informed. However, it's important to be cognizant of where you're obtaining your sources, right? The kind of of, shall we say, food that you are consuming. And so to be very discerning about the sources of information that you're taking in as well. And that goes not only to technology, but also to our food, to our actual nutritional consumption as well, to be cognizant of what we're taking in. So we're refraining from the consumption of artificial colors and flavors and preservatives and, and things that can harm the physical body Similarly, we have to be careful about what we're taking because the, uh, I've been kind of sharing with people that I, I feel that we've kind of become a little soft around the spiritual middle, so to speak. And, um, you know, as a consequence, we're taking in quite a bit of toxicity and quite a bit of poison and um, the opportunity to engage in civil and constructive and courageous dialogue is disintegrating as you know, people are resorting to more cowardly ways of engaging through the internet and texting and you know, um, the I say, disparaging comments that, that people are waging or the defamatory information that's out in the world versus having the courage to have a conversation directly with someone that can you know, perhaps engender some discomfort you know, to be able to articulate one's truth face to face or, you know, on a video call, or rather than hiding behind the screen and, uh, you know, casting aspersions upon someone and continuing to perpetuate the toxicity and the poison in the world. And, you know, we see this playing out on Twitter and, and Facebook. And, and so these are very unhealthy ways of, of human engagement. So, okay, so let's, let's shift to how to be a good steward, how to be a good leader, um, because whether it, we're talking about self-leadership or we're talking about leading our, our group of people, our team, our company, our organization, 
you know, how can, uh, how can we get past that block, get beyond that, uh, that easy way of just uh, communicating indirectly and therefore opening up so much to misinterpretation and misinformation. So what do you guide people to do for clear communication? Well, to cultivate the courage to have a conversation directly with someone. Uh, I believe that's really critical so that we can have proper understanding, right? To articulate one's truth, you know, to also be willing to agree to disagree and not cast that person out of one's life, right? We have this you know, polarized kind of thinking of, you know, that goes back to an unhealthy way of being where either you're for or against me. But we live in a world now that it's important for us to come together in solidarity. And you know, inevitably in every relationship, there's going to be differences and conflicts that will arise. And rather than discarding someone, it's about opening the door to be curious and courageous enough to, to speak to someone directly. So my advocacy um, for whether it be a, a couple that is having strife or maybe people in a friendship or um, in a community or in a corporate environment. It, it really doesn't matter what the context is, but that there are uh, courageous civil conversations. And as a consequence, it can minimize any sort of misinterpretation that can happen because you're also uh, engaging with that individual, you're hearing the, the inflection of their voice, the timbre of their voice, you are observing also their nonverbal communication and cues. And so all of these are really important rather than just words on a screen or on a page. And, and you know, I'm, I'm thinking that here we are in this time of really reflection and reviewing, well, what worked, what relationships worked, what communications worked, right? How were we able to accomplish what we did or didn't accomplish? And in, under, and in looking at all of that, we're, we'll also be able to identify, well, here's a person. Do I still want to have a relationship with this person or do I need to clean it up somehow? Um, and that takes a level of inner knowing and inner clarity right? How do you help people get to that space of cl inner clarity? Well, that's what the ceremonies are for. That's what our dreams are for. So, um, and of course, the inner work that is essential for each and every, every one of us to do, right? So um, I really encourage your listeners and our viewers here to have a solid spiritual practice, whatever that may be, which involves prayer, meditation, movement, ritual, ceremony, not only done and performed individually, but perhaps in community, right? And so we have mirrors of reflection that are also looking back at us as well. And in so doing, we begin to build a resiliency and a fortitude and flexibility and adaptability, right? So I believe now um, the, the current catchphrase that's, that's growing in popularity is anti-fragility, right? So for me, that's, you know, the fragility would be soft around the spiritual middle, right? And so we can begin to you know, cultivate a fortitude and a strength to be able to endure the adversities and the challenges that we encounter, which therefore, in this time of reflection, includes an evaluation of ensuring that the relationships that we have are nurturing for ourselves, and similarly, that we are also nurturing toward others in our lives. And so if we're finding that you know, we are remiss or perhaps not engaging in the same level of reciprocity with someone that we can uh, alter our behavior to be able to be a better friend or mentor or colleague. 
Um, and so that's really part of this work here is that we have a, an honest assessment of ourselves, our own conduct, our own behavior, that's going within as well, evaluating what, our, um, what we need to change, right? what kind of behaviors do we need to amend in our lives, you know, looking at our patterns and our wounds and our issues and our addictions and, and actually not projecting on others or blaming others for our circumstances, but taking responsibility for these things so that we can make changes. And therefore also evaluating our relationships to perhaps um, not necessarily immediately discard someone, but perhaps that conversation that we invite to say, you know, I'm, I'm feeling that I'm not receiving um, the kind of nourishment that I need in this friendship or in this relationship. You know, is there any adjustments that can be made, right? And then of course, if the individual that you're speaking with is, is not amenable to that, then you know, perhaps it's time to you know, let that individual go. You know, but I always believe that things need to be done in a mature fashion. I think it's important uh, oftentimes in relationships that uh, if there's a, a fracture or disagreement, then you know, the relationship oftentimes can, can, um, can dissolve in an unhealthy or immature fashion. And so that toxin and that poison then gets carried into all of our other relationships. And so it's important for us to take a, a mature approach, which means even if a relationship must conclude that it's done in a peaceful, loving, and kind way. Absolutely, absolutely. So then as we're doing all this cleanup and clarification and tidying up our house, <laughs> Um, we, we turn to what is our vision? What is our vision for the future? And I know that visioning and vision quest is very specific within indigenous practices and, and cultures. Um, the general concept of visioning for your life or for whatever you're visioning for, how do you explain that or how do you position that for, for us regular people who are not necessarily engaged in the, the nourishing practices you have? Well, to begin by saying that it's not my vision, right? So mm, I prefer not to take ownership of a vision, but rather to be an instrument through which a vision can be placed a seed planted, if you will, by the ancestors or by the, the great mystery, right? So, for example, when, when people do undertake a traditional hamblecha, as it's called in Lakota, which is crying for a dream, which is fasting without food and water and sleep for four days and three or four nights, then you are attempting to empty yourself to become an instrument through which the source can provide vision to you. So it's not your vision per se, but it's the vision that the source or the ancestors have for you to fulfill, right? So essentially we become an instrument that can be downloaded, if you will, right? So the, the, the source downloads this information that we then can act upon for the benefit of others, right? So the vision or the dream the original instructions that we spoke of earlier is not for us, it's, it's not self-serving, but rather it's in service to all of creation. And so um, oftentimes the, the word that's used for visioning or dreaming within corporate contexts is more about what I would call brainstorming, right? Which is more the generation of ideas from ourselves which is certainly a constructive practice, but my, you know, my orientation is more in relationship to become what's called a hollow bone, which is the words that uh, Chief Frank Fool's Crow, um, a Lakota holy man would use, to become a hollow bone, which allows the medicine and the powers of the universe and the unseen, right? And, uh, 
and the medicine to work through us for the benefit of the whole. That's, um, it's like being the channel of the divine energy and allowing the communication. For me, it's the communication to allow the communication to come through so that the messages can be heard. Yes, beautifully expressed. Well, thank you. <laughs> so, so leaders, leaders, entrepreneurs, people who have stepped up to say, I, I have something more to give. I have something more that I'm here to do, to serve. Um, in this time of introspection and looking forward to the new year, what do you see as um, guideposts or, or what are the messages that you're getting that our leaders need to focus on now? I've been reflecting upon the life and the medicine of Chief Crazy Horse, who, in my estimation, was the greatest military chief in North America. And um, there's a wonderful book uh, that was written by Joseph Marshall, uh, who is also a Lakota. And in it, he describes the leadership style of Chief Crazy Horse. And in this time of, of winter and reflection and recapitulation and introspection, I believe it's important for leaders in whatever arena they operate in, but also for all individuals to, to take that honest reflection and introspection and evaluation and determine what their strengths are as a leader, right, as a guide, but also to be honest enough to assess where their weaknesses lie, right? And I don't want to put any sort of judgment upon strength and weakness, right? We can, there's different terminologies that we can use, but what I mean by weakness is like the the things that require some attention and refinement in one's life, right? And so we all have our fort. We all have the things that we do well and the things that require a little bit of concentration. And I do think that in this time of, of the winter of dreaming, that all of our listeners and viewers take this time to acknowledge the gifts and the strengths the fort that they have, but also to look at the things that require their attention and their compassionate concentration. And to utilize this time so that when the spring emerges, they are a different person. Right? So the evaluation will be different that you know they've taken that time to cultivate their awareness and their actions to begin to shapeshift some of these patterns that they've seen. And that, therefore, there's going to be an improvement in the quality of their leadership. Right? Because leadership is also a journey. And, you know, every single human being is fallible. We all have the things that require our attention and our love. And so it's important for us to understand that no human being is perfect, no leader is perfect, that we all have our humanity and the wounds and fears and issues that all of us require to grow. And so for me, part of uh, being a leader is also fearlessness, right? Yes. That yeah. we're willing to cultivate the courage and the bravery to dive into our wounds and our patterns and our issues to heal them. And that's where the spiritual practices that I'm speaking of are essential. Right? You know, my, my frame of reference is indigenous leaders throughout the world, all of whom have a 
abiding relationship with the source and with the ancestors and the earth. And so it's, it's a part of the matrix of the way that they operate, that they have a sacred connection, right? And I look at all the awakened warriors of the world, you know, Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa. Again, this is beyond you know, gender and identity. You know, we're talking about human beings who are striving to continue to awaken and to be of service. And all the ones that, that I hold in tremendous esteem always have had a relationship with the creator, with the great mystery, great spirit, ancestors, and earth, regardless of who they were. And I believe that um, so much of the Western world is, is predicated on a secular kind of leadership. And I believe it's important that we have sacred leadership, right? Not that you want to necessarily um, you know, mandate that your employees, for example, have to engage in the same practice that, that, that you are. But nevertheless, you know, if you are a leader of a corporation, it's important that you have a sacred practice that informs your life because you also set a very good example for your employees, right? For those in your field who are perhaps maybe inspired to engage in their own spiritual practice, even if it's different than your own. Right? And so we are <clears throat> not just focusing on the earthly plane of awareness, but we are receiving that insight and that information from other sources. You know, you know the, the understanding of our place here on this planet and how we are um, stewards, yes, but we are just one part of a much larger planet here. Um, so much, I mean, people, it's, it's wonderful when people are out in nature and they're hiking and they're enjoying, you know, their physicality, yet that, that making that sacred connection, having that understanding of how all of this in front of you is really an extension of your internal world. It's an extension of your spirit. And how, how do you help people to come, understand that? You know, understand that they are part of nature, not just someone to use, use it. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, part of that teaching for me is letting people know that it's not themselves, an extension of themselves, but actually the earth is a living sentient being. And all of these relations are literally our family and that they have their own sovereignty. They have their own trajectory, right? their own path. Um, so it's not world as self, right? But rather we are a part of this spider's web of creation, if you will, that has been woven and dreamed by grandmother spider, right? And you know, if we look at the origin stories of all human beings on the earth, human beings are the last to be created, not the first. Therefore, we do not have dominion and control over the earth and all of our inhabitants, these inhabitants here, but rather we are the youngest on the planet. We have the most to learn. And indigenous cultures have reverence and respect for or their elders. So in this case, if we understand that everything is alive, which is a fundamental uh, understanding and reality for indigenous peoples throughout the world, then earth, air, fire, water, these are the first sentient elders that existed on this planet. And we have terms in in terms of, of kinship that we use. So we say grandfather fire, grandmother water. And those are not arbitrary kinship terms, but rather understanding 
that fundamentally we have a relationship with them. They are our elders, right? We can learn from them. There's much for them to impart to us. Similarly, so the next iteration of, of life on this planet would be the viruses, the bacteria, and the mycelium network, right? That's the next iteration of life. And so these two are our elders and our teachers, right? So COVID has been a profound teacher for every human being. If we really take the time to step back and reflect upon what was the transmission? What was this virus trying to teach us about ourselves? So not to go to war with this virus, but rather to learn from this elder, right? And then the next iteration of evolution on this planet is the plant nations, right? Also sentient living organisms that offer so much to us in terms of health and medicine, right? Healing, sacred awakening with the sacramental plants, for example, right? And then comes the next iteration would be the animal nations, our animal relations. All of these beings have existed before us. And so we have reverence and respect for their counsel, for their medicine. Well, that's why indigenous nations extol and honor and actually protect, take care of all of these beings on the earth, as well as our mother earth herself, right? We even call mother earth for that reason, because there is a understanding of relationship. So by helping people to cultivate those relationships, to begin to, again, shape shift the perception of dominion and domination and control, to understand that we're a humble human being, that are one strand within this beautiful, intricate, interrelated web of creation is essential. Right? And therefore, also to move beyond the intellectual understanding to an embodied somatic one, which means to spend time in nature, to say, engage in sacred practices in the natural world. So when my community and I gather at our purification lodge here in the San Francisco Bay Area, we are going in the, literally into the womb of the mother. And we are, you know, breathing in and connecting with the earth and the air and the fire and the water, right? These fundamental elders and constituents of existence on this planet. So it becomes an embodied and lived experience. And oftentimes that's the wake up call, right? You know, to mindfully walk in nature, to take a hike without one cell phone, <laughs> yeah? To leave the cell phone back and to listen to the music of nature, to engage and pay attention. It, it actually, honestly, it breaks my heart to see people gazing in their phones when they're walking down the street and they miss that eagle in the sky right? or, or the bird that is singing because they are tuning out the world, not connecting with nature rather than being present, which is a part of every spiritual practice, right? So again, it goes back to also ensuring that one is not addicted to one's cell phone, but rather knows when it's time to put it down. You know, I was uh, in a restaurant the other day and again, seeing people gazing at their phones rather than engaging in conversation with the person across the table from them. Right? So there has been a disintegration of relationship and social engagement as a consequence of these addictive substances known as cell phones. Thank you for that beautiful teaching. 
I've never heard it that way, but it, it makes complete sense. And it's filled in a missing piece for me. And I, I truly appreciate that. And I'm sure our listeners do also. Um, so you're talking really about being present in your lived experience, live life, you know, to be aware of, I mean, really every moment, every breath, I think if anything, we are coming out of the last few years understanding how precious life is. So, all right, all right. Um, do you have any last thoughts that come up for you? Before I ask my two final questions, I have two now. <laughs> well, there's nothing that comes to mind. I think you know, we really have addressed some important aspects and, you know, I would really encourage people to, to cultivate courage and bravery, to have the important, often difficult conversations, you know, to cultivate resiliency and flexibility and adaptability in their lives, um, you know, which also means, therefore, to, to, to find ways to, shall I say, have understanding and to be able to receive uh, constructive feedback, right? To also be able to give constructive feedback in a way that can be received, right? So learning how to deeply listen and also how to communicate in a skillful way. I think that's gonna be essential so we begin to stop the toxicity that is happening in terms of people um, being quite vicious, you know, online, uh, in social media platforms. And for me, that's not constructive for us to move as a species in a, a favorable direction. I believe it's actually kind of um, backsliding. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Good reminders, good point. You know, it's like, oh, there's a point to think about as I am picking up my phone and trying to communicate with someone. Let's, let's be constructive. Let's remember the person on the other side is trying just as hard as you are and that they're a leader too. They're a leader too. So, okay, my second to last question, okay? Um, Imagine you're at the top of a mountain and you look down and surrounding, surrounding the base of the mountain are millions of people and they're all starting to walk up the hill towards you. And the reason they're coming towards you is because you have a message. You have a message for them and you're the only one who can give this message. What is your message? Hmm. Well, the message is to keep climbing, to persevere, don't stop, and to continue to receive guidance from the source, however you describe that, be aware of the earth, and pay attention to the ancestors. Beautiful, thank you. And my final question, if you had the ability to speak to all the leaders in the world and you knew that they would listen to you and take to heart what you had to say, possibly even act on it, what would you say? To cultivate the humility to be an instrument of selfless service, that in the position of responsibility that you have, that it's not for self-serving purposes. And to put the people first, put those who you are serving first, and to keep the earth in your eye. Meaning your actions have to ensure the sustainability 
of our earth and the protection of all beings on it for seven generations and beyond. Yes, thank you for reminding us of our responsibility to the future. Yes. And one more thing, mm -hmm. that it's time to come together in solidarity to stop the rhetoric and the politics and understand that our survival as a species is truly contingent upon coming together in solidarity and really honoring, as far as I'm concerned, the ways that indigenous peoples have been able to live in balance on this planet for thousands of years. And so a quest to, to honor and respect in the wisdom and the medicine and the practices of indigenous peoples, to have them at the table, to uh, ensure that there can be a earth for seven generations and beyond. Because oftentimes indigenous peoples, their voices are not being honored or utilized in our current contemporary world, um, they're often a, a silenced, right, or overlooked, and so um, it's important that that leaders come together to put down their differences and understand that we're running out of time, right? That truly, the the trajectory of our human species is unsustainable at this point. And so it isn't about <clears throat> politicking and rhetoric, you know, that it's not about profits. It's about putting the people and the earth first. And that's the only way that we're gonna survive as a species. And so therefore, if there are people in positions of responsibility. I never say the word power, because for me, human beings don't have power, right? Power is the earthquake that just transpired in Northern California yesterday, right? Power is this storm that is moving across the Northern portion of North America. That's power. But human beings have responsibility to act in a way for the health and betterment and welfare of the earth and all beings upon her. And that's what we need to do, I believe, for us to survive and for all life to survive. And it truly is disconcerting to see how we as a species have forgotten this covenant that we have, which is to be responsible, loving stewards and protectors of the earth and all life upon her. Thank you so much for that message, Chief Philip. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for being my, my first guest for our resumption of the Leader's Edge. Um, it has been a pleasure to have you. We will have you back. We will have you back. And um, how can people find out more about you and your community and your teachings? So uh, there are several ways to reach me. The most efficient way is by phone at 415-310-0981. And they're welcome to text or leave me a voicemail. I enjoy conversation and engagement that way. They can also reach me via email, philip, P-H-I-L-L-I-P, at ancestralvoice.org. And we also have a Facebook page, and that's ancestralvoice.org. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. is Institute for Indigenous Lifeways. Yes, yes, Ancestral Voice Institute for Indigenous Lifeways. And... Um, we will put that in the show notes here on, on YouTube. And thank you so much for joining us, Chief Philip. It's my pleasure, Bailan. And uh, yeah, what a beautiful, auspicious commencement and resumption. 
of your interviews on the winter solstice. Yes, I am. I'm so excited to begin again. <laughs> well, Lots thank you. Thank you. In this winter season and for our listeners and viewers. And uh, I wish them many blessings in this season of holy days, regardless of whatever faith tradition they partake of. Well, thank you. Thank you. And um, yes, thank you so much for your sharing of leadership. And we look forward to more. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. My name is Bailan Mahina, the founder of Global Dream Makers and the creator of the Dream Maker Matrix. We've been honored to have you join us for today and hope you will be coming back. We are here every week on Wednesdays and just check our YouTube channel and uh, we'll have other places we'll be, but <laughs> looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. Many blessings. Many blessings. Okay, so let me...